Welcome everyone. My name is Annie Rogers and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'd like to thank you for joining today's ADHD experts presentation titled Motivating the Unmotivated, Strategies for Middle and High School Students with ADHD. Leading today's presentation is the incredibly talented and generous friend to Attitude, Dr. Sharon Celine. Dr. Sleen is a clinical psychologist and author of the award-winning book, What Your Child Wishes You Knew, working together to empower kids for success in school and life, and the ADHD Solution Deck. She specializes in working with children, teens, emerging adults, and families living with ADHD, anxiety, learning disabilities, autism, twice exceptionality, and other mental health issues. Her unique perspective as a sibling in an ADHD home, combined with decades of experience as a clinical psychologist and educator, clinician, and consultant, assists her in guiding families and adults toward effective communication and closer connections. Dr. Celine lectures and facilitates workshops internationally on topics including understanding ADHD, executive functioning, anxiety, motivation, different kinds of learners, and the teen brain. She is a regular contributor to Attitude and Psychology Today.com. She's a featured expert on mass appeal on WWLP TV and a part time lecturer at the Smith School for Social Work. Her writing has been featured in numerous online and print publications um, Attitude, of course, also MSN, the Psychotherapy Network, Smith College Studies in Social Work. Attention Magazine, Psych Central, and Inquirer.com. You can learn much more about her at www.drsharonsaline.com. That's drsharonsaline.com. In today's webinar, we will discuss what drives or saps motivation in kids uh, and teens with ADHD. We will be looking squarely at executive functions here today whether it's time management, working memory, prioritization, you name it, our expert will offer collaborative strategies to improve adolescent motivation. Before I hand over the microphone to Dr. Celine, I have just a few housekeeping items. If you're watching the live webinar, submit your questions anytime in the text box under the video player. To download slides, click on the event resources section of your webinar screen. Instructions for obtaining a certificate of attendance will arrive via email later today, and a transcript of today's event will be made available in the coming week. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com. Just search for podcast 437 to access the slides, the webinar replay, the certificate of attendance option, and the webinar transcript. We encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine. If you do so now, you will get our outstanding spring issue, which includes contributions from Dr. Celine on ADHD relationship rescue, plus some vital information about eating disorders, ADHD in women, and much, much more. Finally, the sponsor of today's webinar is Landmark College the first college in the U.S. to exclusively serve students who learn differently, also offers short-term programs that help neurodivergent high schoolers make the successful transition to college academically and socially. Click the link on your screen or visit www.landmark.edu slash teen to learn more about residential and online options. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. Without any further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Sharon Celine. Thank you so much for joining us today and leading this discussion on motivation. Thank you, Annie, for that lovely introduction. And I'm so excited to be here. Uh, um, motivation is an issue near and dear to my heart, as it's something that you know I think we all struggle with. So let's get started. 
uh, I want to remind you that in the notes that you'll receive from this webinar that there's a free downloadable that covers a lot of the material I'm talking about today. So you can just sit back and listen. And uh, when you um, get that email, click for the downloadable and you'll be connected to my community as well as having the information from today. So does this sound familiar? With my parents, it's like, stop nagging me. You're giving me such a hard time and making me feel like crap about myself. If I have homework for math, but it's not due till Thursday, I'll be like, ugh, I don't want to do it now because I have till Thursday to do it. But they want me to do it ahead of time. So I end up yelling at them to leave me alone. Tyler, age 14. I don't really love doing my laundry, so I keep putting it off day after day until a pile is truly absurd. By the time I finally resolve to do it, the mountain of laundry amounts to a much bigger chore than it would have been if I had only tackled it earlier. Zara, age 17. How about this one? I wait until the last minute or not do it at all. When I work, when I start, I work straight through. I'm talking about last minute, the period before, not even the night before. I don't do as good a job, and I know that I'm super crunched for time, but I can't seem to change this. Finn, age 15. And lastly, we have Ashley, age 12. I try to do everything as quickly as I can, so I have time for other fun things, for myself, to hang out with my friends, other last minute stuff. Um, now, if we're talking about motivation, I feel like I have to honor my colleague and his incredible work in the field of ADHD, Thomas, Dr. Thomas Brown. In his book, ADHD and Asperger's Syndrome in Smart Kids and Adults, he writes, all those with ADHD tend to have a, a few specific activities for which they have no difficulty in deploying these executive functions, which are problematic for them in almost any other tasks they undertake. So what he's saying is that a strong personal interest in something or a belief that something bad could happen immediately if the task isn't completed, both of these can be motivating for um, tweens and teens. Um, in consistency in motivation, however, is, is one of the most confusing aspects of ADHD, whether you're six, 16, or 60. Okay, and so this inconsistency in motivation is part and parcel of having ADHD. Often there can be low self-esteem that get interferes with doing something, the hatred of the task, the inability to see anything but the pain of this moment because the ADHD brain is a now, not now brain. So there might be a distraction of easier activities that can get done so you feel like you're accomplishing something. And also the expression that we start to see and from middle school and upwards of kids growing independence and making their own choices, which one of my clients used to call, um, you know, knock them up and shoot me down because, um, Every time her, she would say something to her, you know, middle school daughter, it was no, no, no. And why are you asking me? Pow, pow, pow. And then maybe 30 minutes later, come back and say, you know, I thought about it and I would like to blah, blah, blah. Now, motivation is an equation. And the equation is that action plus a reason to engage equals motivation. And motivation is about believing you can do something and having the skills to get there. And for tweens and teens with their developing brains and their developing skills, they may not either A, remember how they've succeeded in the past and apply it to the current moment, or B, lack confidence because there haven't been enough of those successes to form a, a, you know, a, a foundation that, yeah, I can take, I can, I can do this, I'm, I'm capable. So let's talk a little bit about adolescent developmental issues because that's part of what it means to be a tween or a teen. So 
how about the adolescent brain? So adolescents actually um, ha can create a hypothesis about an actual or potential event and test it against reality. They're interested in the process of problem solving, um, not just the solution. They can be largely self-centered and self-focused. Um, and there's also a movement away from family bonds into society at large. And what we'll see is criticism of parents and adults in an effort to create distance. Yet the, the problem for them, the conundrum, as it were, one of my favorite words, is that they're still dependent on their parents or their caring adults and therefore connected to them. Sometimes teens with ADHD will welcome help from adults, but often they're ambivalent about it or just downright rejecting of whatever well-intentioned advice you are going to give. Luis, age 17, says, yeah, I'd be like, I don't need their help. I can deal with this on my own. I'd say proud, yeah, I even get a little cocky. Sometimes, though, you do need to get help from other people, even though you're independent. You can't always just storm through your life alone at times. That's pretty insightful for a 17-year-old, and, and that's very different than how a 13 or 14-year-old will feel about asking for or receiving help. Now, as adults, as parents um, or caregivers or coaches, whoever's watching, I welcome all of you. Um, you know, you're too, we are also figuring out how, when to step in and when to let the chips fall where they may. And that distinction is one of the hardest distinctions for parents and caregivers. Um, and it's something that um, coaches and therapists struggle with themselves. How, when do we co when do we advise you to step in? And, you know, my bottom line around this is around safety safety, health and safety, you know, are times when adults absolutely need to step in. Of course, the question is, why don't kids with ADHD ask for help? Why do they reject it? And usually that answer is related to shame, which we'll talk about a little bit later. In fact, Rowan, age 15, as it recalls that as early as fifth grade, I was embarrassed that I had a disability because Rowan has ADHD along with dyslexia. Uh, I think I denied it, but I definitely knew that I was a ADD. I contested for a long time because I didn't want to be seen as somebody that needed extra help. So she feels ashamed and you may not see that it's underneath, but what you're seeing on top is that anger, is that protestation or tears or yelling about something that's completely unrelated. Now in our next slide is a poll. So I'm gonna ask um, Attitude if you'd launch a poll. It's our first poll and our only poll today. Uh, what do you think your, te your tween or teen is struggling with the most in terms of motivational challenges? So can we launch this survey? Um, do you want me to do it? It's done, okay, great. I just don't see it, okay. So what are some of the things that I see twe tweens and teens struggling with? Low motivation and uninteresting tasks. And that's hard for people who don't have ADHD, but when you have lower amounts of dopamine in your brain naturally, dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter and the pathways that have to do with satisfaction and interest, pleasure from a task, those, the amounts of dopamine in an ADHD brain are, all, are already lower than a non-ADHD brain. And so now we're asking them to do a task that is low, a very low dopamine task. It's very hard to muster up the energy to get that done. So if we, um, uh, if I wanna see the results of the survey, I'm gonna navigate. Oh, we got lots of people in, in involved. Um, following through on homework and chores, managing time and responsibility, disorganization, procrastination, oppositionality, you know, that pushback that you get. I'm not really a big fan of the term defiance, so I prefer oppositionality and, of course, anxiety. And so far, we're not um, sending the results out yet, but so far it looks like low motivation and uninteresting tasks is what kids are struggling with the most, followed by following through on homework and chores. So when the survey is complete, which will be hopefully soon, um, attitude is going to 
uh, share the results of that. Let me know when you do that, please. So let's move on because we have limited time. Um, now, Ross Green, uh, who is someone I really deeply admire and I've done some training with, he talks about how kids would do well if, if they can. And I would say that kids with ADHD will do well if they can, and they have the appropriate uh, resources and supports available to them uh, uh, when they need it. When they need it. So one of the what happens, and Ro and Ross Green talks about, is that doing well is always better than not doing well. I mean, think about this. You know, who wants to walk around not doing well? Nobody. But with 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 the with with ADHD, a lot of times kids struggle. They lack the self esteem to put in the effort in advance to make the outcome different. When kids expect failure, there's a way that they've given up on themselves. And oftentimes they've given up on themselves because the message that they've received is that adults have given up on them or adults have been unable to help them or adults don't really understand them. And so instead of asking the or questions like, what is wrong with this kid or why can't you do this? The, que the first question needs to be, what's happening for you, around you, in your environment and internally that is making it hard to do this? What can be changed in the environment and in the person in terms of your approach that would, that would offer a more positive outcome? This, of course, relies on compassion remembering what it takes for kids who are alternative learners to get through. And if you yourself were an alternative learner, what it took for you to get through. And maybe, you know, what mattered to you when you were 14, 15, or 16? You know, I'm working with someone right now who is a 14, and he, he really wants uh, to get Snapchat. And his parents are concerned about that because there's impulse control issues uh, and emotional regulation that go along with the computer and social media sometimes. And so we're, we've launched um, a program, an experiment, where he, um, he's, his work is to get off the computer when it's time to get off the computer with, with fewer meltdowns, to put deposits in the trust bank account for Snapchat. And when, you know, I asked him, well, why do you want Snapchat? And he's like, that's, I want a girlfriend. And I can't get, I can't get a girlfriend if I don't have Snapchat. And my heart was like, oh, you're 14, of course, <laughs> you know, you, you know, we, people don't go to the mall anymore, which is what they did in my era and hang out and have pizza and, you know, whatever, walk around the mall. So it really touched me and, you know, it kind of opened this, the conversation that we were able to have with the family. So one of the goals we want to have when we're dealing with kids who are struggling is not just to think about what are their goals and inquire about them and be curious about um, how we can create incentives that matter, but to help them accept the brains that they have and normalize that we all have strengths and challenges. So we want to be transparent. Nobody wants to have a disorder. And by the, that term is can often foreign for people. You know, ADHD, you know, what kind of brain do you think you have? And that's what I often ask my kid, the clients I work with, my kids. Um, what kind of brain do you think you have? Oh, I have a wandering brain. Oh, I have a fast brain. I have a dreamy brain. I have a foggy brain. Then we can talk about that, you know, oh, okay, when your brain wanders or when your brain is moving very fast, that is nearer to their experience. And I think this would help while we're talking about motivation. So this relies on my five C's approach, which I'm just gonna go over a little bit uh, here. So what is our overall goal when we're dealing with motivational challenges in kids with ADHD, learning disabilities, um, ASD uh, or anxiety or depression? 
our goal, our ultimate goal, the big goal here is to maintain a positive adult teen connection. Because if you don't have that positive teen, positive connection with your child, that so that sense of um, attunement in some way, nothing's really going to happen in terms of uh, fostering a plan that you can work together. So what we want to do is practice the five C's, self-control, identify triggers and manage dysregulation, yours and theirs. What sets people off? what sets and, and what happens when people are set off. Because usually what happens is people are surprised when there's a meltdown that something's difficult instead of predicting, oh, well, you know what? This sci science is tough for you. So we're going to you know, have a plan that we can apply to that. Pick one behavior that you would like your child to change. We, a lot of times parents is like, we want them to work on this and this and this and this, and we, they can't do it. It's too much. So pick one thing, talk with your child about what the current challenges are around motivation, make a list and see what's on both of your lists. And if there's overlap and maybe start with the overlap piece. Um, so that's both compassionate because you're adjusting your expectations to the child you have, not some idealized version or some neurotypical child. Um, you're meeting them where you are and you're collaborating with them by making a plan together to work on that one issue. So in the, in the, in the case in the, uh, of the client that I was talking about, the issue was that the client, the parents didn't have faith or trust that the child would be able to use Snapchat appropriately. And there were also these meltdowns when the child's time to get stop gaming was occurring. So we put those together and tied them so that it, to get off the computer and not have a meltdown means you're showing your parents that you're ha you have the maturity for Snapchat. And that desire for Snapchat is a really big incentive. So we're going to support their efforts um, by redirecting them when necessary. We're not aiming for perfection. We're just aiming for consistency more times than not. And we're going to celebrate the progress that we see towards the achievement of what the goal is, whether or not it's fully completed. I think think I might be asking you to do the slides. Would you mind being able to move the slides for me? I just want to keep, keep up the pace here. So motivation itself is linked to several executive functioning skills. And the ex executive functioning skills we know are right here behind our forehead is the seat in our prefrontal cortex um, and uh, that are the directive capacities of the brain um, where then they unfold developmentally as people use them, but not in a linear fashion. In, um, in uh, children and teens with ADHD, there can be up to three year lag in, in, the, in the way the brain coalesces and matures uh, with the connections of those um, executive functioning skills. And that's why we see a lot of challenges with pro procrastination, disorganization, forgetfulness, impulsivity and inattentiveness, because often what occurs to some kids to do without thinking can be really harder for the for our out of outside the box thinkers, those kids who struggle, um, who are neurodivergent. So motivation is composed of several things. It's why you do something. So the first thing is initiation, getting started on something, often without direction and excessive reminding. You're motivated to begin a task. Time management, doing things on time and meeting deadlines, correctly estimating how long something will take. Organization and prioritizing, where's your stuff? How do you keep track of it? And how do you decide what's most pressing to do? Sustained attention, managing attention and resisting distractions when faced with a task. Goal-oriented persistence, setting a goal, staying focused on it returning to the task or after an interruption and staying with it again over time. And finally, focus. Take your hand and put it on your forehead. It's the spotlight of your attention, right? So focus is a dynamic process of choosing what is critical to notice or recall. We improve our focus by noticing where it is. Most kids and many adults notice when they return from a drift. 
you know, you sort of space out, you're thinking about something else and you come back. And then what happens to kids and teens with ADHD is there's a little panic. Oh God, what did I miss? What's happening? Where are we? And so we want to teach our tweens and teens how to cope with that drift and have a plan for how to reintegrate. Focus is also composed of four things. This is just for you to remember. F selecting, what am I going to focus on? Monitoring, how am I focusing on it? Hyperfocus, which is a whole topic in and of itself. And of course, shifting from one thing to another. Next slide, please. So how are we going to motivate alternative learners to do the tough stuff? So interest stimulates motivation, and there are two types of motivation. Extrinsic motivation refers to an outside request, reward, or responsibility that depends on achieving a goal. You turn in your permission form for that by Friday for the field trip on, mon uh, on Monday, or you can't go. Intrinsic motivation means striving toward a goal for personal satisfaction or accomplishment. You decide you want to ride three miles instead of two. You want to get to that next level in your computer game. When a task is fundamentally unrewarding or uninteresting, doing, the home, doing homework, doing the dishes, there's naturally less excitement, less dopamine, as I was talking about before. And it takes kids with ADHD longer to get moving and to get engaged in the task because there are no, there's no clear um, immediate satisfaction or benefit for those less interesting tasks. Um, there's struggles to do it. Um, and then sometimes there's just you know, pushback, I'm not going to do it. There are arguments, meltdowns, avoidance. So external incentives, Snapchat, so you cannot have family meltdowns, uh, meltdowns uh, getting off computer. Snapchat is an external incentive that encourages a child or a teen until the satisfaction of doing the task itself kicks in. So the satisfaction will be, hey, I got off my computer you know, when I was supposed to, and um, there was no fight. So that was really cool. Um, the internal satisfaction mechanism really kicks in for teens around, you know, the latter part of adolescence and the early 20s. And if we are talking about kids with ADHD, we want to add three years. So this is a slower process that is enabled with using external incentives. And if you say, well, does this mean you're going to have, you have to use in external incentives for the rest of your life? I'd probably say, yes, don't you do that for yourself? For me, I make dinner and then I do the dishes before I watch my show because I know once I watch my show, I'm never going to do the dishes. So the show is the reward for doing the dishes. Then I can chill out, relax on the sofa, do some knitting. We do this all the time as adults. So we're going to teach this to our kids. So we want to put the have to's before the want to's. And that's a key when, pe when kids don't want to do something, when they're really struggling with motivation. They, all they see is the have to. There's no want to at the other side, okay? So we wanna identify incentives that matter. Next slide. Why should you use incentives? Because they uh, train kids to understand that effort leads to satisfying accomplishment. Often incentives fail because parents either don't collaborate effectively with their kids or that the kids get bored with the incentive. Um, it seems to, it can, they, they, they feel like they can't reach it or they need something new. And that's okay to keep them changing, to keep changing them. It, in my work and you know, in my book, What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew, and my card deck and everything that I write, I talk about collaboration as the key to having successful um, pro plans and interactions and collabor and um, and even um, choosing uh, incentives. This collaboration is important because we have to get our kids buy-in to make any difference. So we want to ask our kids, you know, what would you really like in your life? 
what do you love to do? Um, whether it's additional time playing outside, using electronics or social media, going out for a special ice cream, these can all be earned privileges. And time with you can be a privilege too. So we want to really think about um, the, the, that punishment, taking things away, doesn't actually teach any skills. And so we want to teach skills to our kids. Now, does that mean that um, there aren't consequences? No, there are consequences. I'm going to talk about that. But punishment and threats don't teach any kind of motivation. If your child is not cooperating with the terms of the agreement that you made, that's fine. Don't get into it with them because collaboration rarely happens under pressure. You're not going to negotiate the terms of whatever you set up with them in that moment. You can set aside a separate time. Maybe it's a weekly family meeting. Maybe it's tomorrow. But everybody's got to calm down and move on uh, when things aren't happening. Next slide, please. So I know that Michelle Novotny did a great presentation last week for adults on procrastination. I'm going to, of course, talk about procrastination because it interferes with motivation so strongly. So most procrastinators um, struggle with three types of, of, of procrastination, perfectionism, avoidance, and productive. And take a minute now and think about yourself and how you procrastinate. Are you a perfectionist? Do you like things to be just so? They want to be in a certain way. And then when they can't be in that way, what we'll see is people give up. You might be motivated by meeting a deadline and doing a great job and expecting validation. So you're looking to accomplish something perfectly. Um, you may not need to create a comforting order to how you do things. You may also not be able to start something because you don't think you'll be able to do it perfectly or you'll do it, but it's never actually finished because it's not perfect enough yet. So it doesn't get turned in. Um, then we have avoidance procrastination, uh, when things seem too difficult or too unpleasant to begin. A lot of kids can't, um, they can't even get started. Like they can't, it, the, 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 the current moment of unpleasantness is so big, it floods them. So they can't see how they might feel on the other side when it's accomplished. Um, sometimes a lack of confidence in ability in their abilities uh, matched with the difficulty gauging how to approach a task or its size can can interfere with um, motivation. Um, memories of previous failures can haunt beginning an effort. A lot of times with avoidance mo uh, procrastination, the task is like Mount Everest. It's huge. And there's no marker like where do you start the hike? You know, you just, there's no, you don't see a sense of a hike. And even if you did, you think you're never going to get up there anyway. So you don't know where to begin and you don't see a finish. And in for, and, and this is very, this is very much what we see with kids who just like, I'm not going to bother trying. Productive procrastination. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Russell Ramsey calls this procrastivity. Um, they're related to the, they're talking about the same thing, which is how people keep themselves busy doing something else and avoiding the big task because of underlying doubts or fears or, you know, needing it to be just right. So you're, what we'll see is kids doing other things that need to get done, maybe that are easier tasks, um, but they're less urgent or important than the, the main thing that they're avoiding. So they feel temporarily better because, hey, I got this done and I got this done. But the, sh the short-term relief only builds to increasing long-term stress. It's really a delay tactic. Um, Samson, age 15, says, it's hard for me to work at a good pace. I struggle with finding things to look forward to. Life can seem like one big pushing up that stone up the hill. Uh, next slide. So, um, you know, as, I, as you saw on the last slide, the interventions for procrastination um, for, uh, are breaking things down. Um, finding an order of working that makes sense, and creating limited work periods with specific tasks. Why is perfectionism such an issue for people with ADHD? Um, so perfectionism shares many similarities with ADHD. Um, perfectionists are often driven by fear of disappointing themselves or others. It's an all or nothing kind of thinking. If it's not completely right, it must be a failure. Hmm. 
Lots of kids with ADHD think that way too. They may set unreasonable standards for themselves, compare themselves constantly to um, and negatively to individuals who are who are neurotypical, um, and um, and then they criticize themselves. And there are different types of perfectionism. I have a webinar on that for adults if you want to check it out through Attitude. Um, so there's productive, adaptive perfectionism, which supports motivation and productivity. I really want to get it right. I want to do a good job. And then there's toxic, maladaptive perfectionism, which is I never get it right. It sort of perpetuates a negative self-esteem and a rigidity. Um, one of the things that, that happens with ki kids who have ADHD and are also perfectionists is that um, they are trying to control outcomes, which is a fundamental aspect of managing anxiety. You know, living with ADHD means experiencing moments when you're not aware that you're struggling or you've messed up, but you don't know why it's happened or how to fix it. And there's a persistent worry that goes along with when is the next time that I'm going to receive negative feedback when I wasn't expecting it. And that thinking holds people back from getting started or trying things. New slide, please. Now, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on working memory because it is a very important executive functioning skill. Um, it's fundamentally linked to emotional control because emotion drives the engine of working memory. Um, it, working memory is like the computational space in the brain. You hold on to an idea and you do something with it. It also helps you draw up memories from memories from past situations and apply them to the current situation. So, you know, why did I come into this room? What do I have for homework? What did I do last time I had this kind of book report? I don't remember. Um, and so we want to remember for many kids with ADHD that weaker working memory also reduces coping strategies and makes it harder to manage and respond you know, effectively to an intense rush of emotions. So if your rush of emotions is, I really hate this, or I hate this teacher, then it's going to be harder to regulate that not because of you know having ADHD, but also if you struggle with working memory. Um, and I've given some suggestions on the top of that to um, help you. So let's talk about some strategies directly to um, uh, improve motivation. Um, so you'll see here initiation. We want to break things down. We want to work with a child's innate desire for mastery and independence. Kids want to be able to do things on their own. And if they can't, then that's a sign of some other mental health issues, particularly depression, that we want to look into. A time management, make time physical, use alar alarms, alerts, analog clocks. You know, when the numbers pass, like on your digital watch or your digital clock, it doesn't mean anything. So we have to actually show the face of, of how time passes. And of course, I'm a super big fan of the timed timer. There you go. That, and it, basically I have 35 minutes and then I'm gonna watch the orange disappear. So because kids with ADHD have that switch of understanding time often is broken. We also want to teach backwards design, so how much you can do in a certain amount of time. I have to arrive at school at this time. I'm going to need to take a shower in the morning. That's uh, 20 minutes. I have to get dressed. That's 20 minutes. I have to eat breakfast. That's 15 minutes. I have to get my stuff in my backpack. That's another 10 minutes. You know, whatever it is. Oh, okay. And then you subtract all those times, and that is what time you have to wake up. Um, organization, try to use self-smart systems, systems of organization that make sense to your kids' brains, and lay out the steps for completing tasks. Um, often kids can't do this on their own. Create routines and systems for storing materials, both, you know, paper materials, books, and also online materials in terms of filing. And remember that organization, prioritizing, time management, these all work together. So what happens a lot of times with prioritizing is that kids do a brain dump, but they can't order things. Everything seems equally important. So you want to help them understand the difference between urgency, which is a time-related concept, and importance, which is a value-related concept. Um, 
Now, a um, couple more strategies, sustained attention. So set realistic work periods based on how long your child can actually concentrate before they need a break. Talk with them about it. Um, establish an order of work. You know, certain tasks are easy, certain tasks are hard, some are medium. How does your child like to work? Do they want to do the hard thing first, get it out of the way? And for those who take medication, that can also be useful when the meds are still working. And then, you know, do something easy and then something medium. What is the order of work? What subjects, what tasks are um, do you attach to those um, you know, designations as easy, medium, and hard? Um, to support goal-directed per persistence, collaborate on realistic goals. You know, not goals that your child can't reach, but goals that your child actually can accomplish because we need to start the ball rolling that, oh, I'm someone who gets things done. So what happens is a lot of times the goals seem too difficult to reach and there's not a lot of motivation to get started. Talk with your, your teens and tweens about the cues you could give them to help them get back to work. Okay, and what happens, what are some obstacles they might encounter and how can you strategize options? And finally, you know, metacognition, which is the last executive functioning skill to coalesce in the mid to late 20s, is the awareness and understanding of your own thinking and thought processes. And so this helps kids choose and evaluate how they're approaching tasks and helps them measure their progress. So we want to ask open-ended questions like, how, is it, how, how did that work out? What kind of support do you need? Where would you like to work that it makes sense? Next slide, please. Earlier, I talked a little bit about not using punishments and depending on natural and logical consequences. So M, a natural consequence is anything that happens naturally without any kind of interference as a result of action or inaction. And a logical consequence happens as a result of choices that you do or do not make. So um, when, we, when we use nat, nat, natural and logical consequences, we're, um, we're shifting from a punishment model to a, a more empowering model. And this is what's so helpful so for so many uh, kids with ADHD. Um, next slide, please. Now, of course, anxiety affects motivation and uh, <laughs> And how does it do that? So anxiety disorders are related to fears and worries, and they're based on the, the, um, the focus of a person's worry. Anxiety is all about safety and security. It wants to make uncomfortable feelings and uncertainty go away. So what we'll see with, um, with motivational challenges and anxiety is catastrophizing what if thoughts um, that are, you know, that are dire, um, interpreting predictions as facts, uh, lower self-confidence, and all of these things support procrastination. Um, and so because anxiety is a natural human response that from feeling threatened or afraid, um, we, can't we can't do away with it. We're not going to dismiss it entirely, but we want to come up with tools to respond to it in health and manageable ways. Anxiety really supports that all or nothing thinking and a negative expectancy of I can't versus let's try and see what happens. Next slide, please. One of the things related to anxiety is overwhelm freeze. Overwhelm freeze is, is, it directly comes from the intense stress based on having weaker executive functioning skills that impact planning, arranging, you know, and f formulating and executing tasks. What the brain experiences the to-do list as a threat because it's so big, I can't possibly accomplish it. And the body responds accordingly. So these are high stress levels related to a belief that you can't do all these things and you shut down. Next slide, please. Um, so when you're in that, when kids are in that shutdown, what we often experience as adults is lying, avoidance, and pushback. So disrespectful behavior is a signal. What is going on underneath the disrespectful behavior, right? Pushback and oppositional behavior mask other emotions, such as anxiety, depression, lack of self-esteem, um, confusion, um, 
or fear. Um, kids act out when they're bored and angry or frustrated. So we want to expect this. And, and instead of, you know, addressing the problem behaviors in the moment, we want to have an alternative toolbox. Okay. So um, this means establishing doable routines. And if things aren't working, table it and come back to it later when emotions have cooled. A lot of kids will lie um, and they'll do with ADHD because it, they lack impulse control, verbal and behavioral or emotional control. And then they'll regret the things that they've done. And rather than dealing with that directly, they'll sort of make up some excuses or deny their actions or maybe even use magical thinking. If I wish I hadn't said that or I pretend I didn't, maybe no one will notice. So in those cases, we want to manage ourselves first as adults because provocative behaviors can trigger reactivity in us that escalates the situation. So ask yourself, why am I talking now? Maybe this is a time where I listen and I say, uh-huh, we'll, we'll come back to this rather than get into it. Um, consider setting up a take back of the day in your family uh, where everyone has a chance for a redo. Um, this helps with that impulsivity, and it also gives people um, a, an opportunity to practice forgiveness. Um, rely on natural and logical consequences, and set clear and appropriate expectations that are adjusted to fit the child you have, what they can do and what they almost can do. And the things that you, they have to stand on their tippy toes to try to be able to accomplish or reach those are not our goals right now. It's what we can do to create consistency and a routine and the things that are on the shelf right above that. Next slide, please. So of course we want, what we're talking about here is fostering a growth mindset to nurture motivation. Um, when we try something, we're, we risk failure. When we avoid it, we ensure it. So this growth mindset is a belief that we can change, we can regroup after trying something that doesn't work. And we value process over outcome. When something doesn't work, no blame. Let's talk about why, what happened, what are the lessons we can take from it? How are we going to pivot? Next slide, please. Takeaways for a successful motivation plan. Work together, collaborate on creating goals. Your teen and it has to be invested in what you in whatever is created. So we want to make sure that they are change one thing at a time. You can set up different expectations for different capabilities. If kids are really strong at one thing, they can have expectations for that that are different than for the thing that they struggle with. Lay out specific steps, behaviors, and rewards for whatever you come up with and write everything down and put it up on the bulletin board in the kitchen or the refrigerator so people can see it. We want visual cues rather than having to be an auditory reminding machine. That's what a lot of parents do and it causes conflict with their teens. Instead, you can say, check the list. Okay, then they're actually moving themselves through the choices. Defeats are not failures, but they are critical pieces of information. It's like your GPS, it's re you are recalculating. And so we want to uh, reframe defeats as learning opportunities, uh, that it's a part of living to stumble and you know pick yourself up and keep going. Next slide, please. I really hope that you'll stay connected with me. I'm going to leave this slide up for a couple minutes. This is a free bonus of that I was talking to you about. And there's a QR code, which I'm hoping works on your screen um, to get that bonus. You'll also have a link to that in the, in the session notes that Attitude will provide you. So I'm really excited to take your questions. I know I gave you a lot of information. Um, I also want to bring to your attention when you go to my website, check out my upcoming events. Next, on Monday the 16th, I'm starting a group for older teens with Dr. Mike Postma on anxiety. And so if you have a child who is 14 or older, um, please uh, check that out and consider signing them up. Thank you. Um, really happy to be here and I'm excited to take your questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Selene. That was, um, I know that my notebook is chock full of um, information, questions, um, and strategies. So um, we have a lot of questions. Before I begin, I just want to send a quick thank you once again to our sponsor for this webinar, Landmark College. Um, and I want to launch right into what was named um, about 9% of people said the biggest challenge in our poll was oppositionality. So mm -hmm. you talked a little bit about this um, mm -hmm. oppositionality, of course, part and parcel of adolescence. But we're, I'm hearing a lot of comments today from parents facing extreme resistance mm -hmm. to any and all suggestion of solutions um, mm -hmm. and ideas for solutions. So could you suggest a next step for those parents who are being shut out of you know, if they're trying to partner with yes. their child, they really feel they're being shut out and they feel quite hopeless. Right. So, so there are two topic areas for that shut out. One is school and one is home. Um, and when I say home, that would include social life. So the, the question that, um, that I would want to ask the parents is, you know, you, you know, your child doesn't want to hear anything you have to say. And this is what I think you're saying, Annie. And so if your child wants to hear nothing that you want to say, then you have to actually make some agreements about being able to talk about things. So for example, um, I had a child in my, my second child, my daughter, when she <laughs> was in eighth grade, she was like, oh, Ma, you know, I was like, mom, look, and, you know, I said, well, I'd like, you know, I, I need to ha hear a little something about your day every day. And she said, no, I don't want to tell you anything. And I was like, well, I'm responsible for your health, well-being and safety. So we have to have something. So I'd like to ask you one question and you can answer one question. Can we do that? Yes. So the first day I said to her, well, I'd like to hear in a high and a low of your day. And she said, I'm not answering that. It's two questions. So I really understand, you know, I mean, I, I, the, 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 this was super frustrating for me. Of course, she was right. But I, I, when parents are, are dealing with extreme situations where kids are absolutely rejecting them outright. And so in those cases, there are two types of solutions, school. So if your child is it really does not want you involved at all in their schoolwork and they're not able to accomplish their schoolwork at home, then that's actually something that you want to take back to the school and, and ask for a team meeting because then your child needs more support in the school to do the work there rather than um, have to have to have to have, have, have homework struggles. Um, we also might want to think outside the box, which is like, okay, when is the time when your brain is freshest to do 20 minutes of homework? I knew one woman, her son said, I'll wake up at six o'clock. I'll take my medication. I'll do my homework before school, but after school, leave me alone. I'm not doing anything. And they were, this mother was willing to try that experiment and it actually worked. So, so a lot of times when there's this kind of oppositionality that, that you're stuck in a pattern, in a dynamic that isn't working. So in those cases, we want to think outside the box. And sometimes it, you can't do that on your own. So you might want to have a meeting at school. You might want to consider having a, getting a therapist or a coach to help you untangle some of those issues. Now at home, there are other issues too. There are chores, um, there's self-care, uh, and, and we want to set up some basic, you know, guidelines about what those are as living in this house. And when kids are pushing back and they're saying, well, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do this. We want to offer them what I call directed free choice. So you can do, you, you have a choice. You can do this or you can do that or you can do a third thing, but that's it. Those are the choices. Um, because what happens is that kids shut down when they feel like they don't have a choice and they don't want you to tell them what the choices, what they're, what, what to do. So you can say, well, let's think what the choices are. What do you see the choices as? And they'll say, I don't see any choices. And then, um, you can say, okay, so I see that there are three choices. If you're going to, give up your position here and the, to the choices, then I'm going to lay out the choices and you have to pick one. So, you know, I think when you're seeing a lot of extreme resistance, there's, there's other things that are going on that you may or may not know about. And that's why it's important to try to seek help from some professionals. 
thank you. Um, I do want to say a quick note. Some folks are having trouble accessing the free resource. We mm -hmm. will follow up when we send, um, there will be an email that you will receive after the event with the replay link, with the link for the slides, and we will make sure that the resource is linked from that email. So if you can't get it to work right now, don't worry, we will send it to you, I promise. I'm um, very sorry, I'm sorry about that. No, you know, it's QR codes are wonderful until they're not, so. Yes. Um, <laughs> I will move on to an, another big question. 32% um, of people said in the survey that low motivation for uninteresting tasks was their biggest yes. challenge. And part and parcel of this is um, phones. It is the dopamine hit of <laughs> phones and I should say video games, social media in general. And so many parents are really struggling with that. Um, taking away a phone is a huge, huge um, downside for, for teens um, mm -hmm. and can send them into a tailspin, really. So right. how in the world could you motivate a kid away from this dopamine machine to oh, right. these uninteresting yeah. tasks. So so the way you have to set up is to go back to think about what I said. The have to comes before the want to. So the phone is a privilege. I mean, I know I'm old and probably outdated, but you know, it's not it's not a given. You know, what are givens are things like, you know, health, um, love, education, safety, clothing, shelter, you know, those are things that are given. A phone is a privilege. And for many kids, you as a parent pay for this privilege. So you have to set some limits around the privilege. So, you know, if, if you can have two hours of screen time a day, that's not school related, which screen do you want it to be on? Because once you're done, then, the, then you're done. A lot of times for parents, what's hard is actually taking the steps to deal with the disappointment, the anger, and the pushback. I'm, I'm working with someone, and this is a real issue uh, for this ninth grader, and the, um, the agreement is that the phone gets turned in at a certain time, and the phone can, and to the parents, and then the phone can be picked up again for, you know, when they wake up in the morning. And if, if, that there is pushback, if there's yelling, if there's meltdowns, then the phone will stay home that following day. And this is very difficult for a lot of parents because it leaves them with anxiety, like, well, I can't reach my kid, I don't have their phone. You could maybe notify the school and let them know that. Um, kids want their phone because it's how they feel like they are connected to people. There's a lot of FOMO that's attached to phones. You know, what am I not a part of? It's like, this is a security blanket, you know, that I'm carrying around. So you have to set up study periods that are where getting access to the phone is the incentive. So you work for 30 minutes, you have a five minute phone break to, to check your Snapchat and your TikTok or whatever you wanna do. And when the timer goes off, um, the phone goes back down and you do another 30 minutes. And if you're, and if that's not what's happening, then I'll just keep the phone while you're doing your homework and you can have it as a reward for when you're finished. This kind of thinking earned privilege mentality towards phones is, is, is how we can reduce the stress and tension in families um, around motivation because they're motivated by all these you know, exactly high dopamine activities, but reading 30 minutes, you know, I have to read, you know, Edgar Allan Poe. Ugh. <laughs> so, you know, how are we going to break down Edgar Allan Poe and incentivize it? You know, all phone, all screen time is not created equally. So it might be an hour of, um, of, of gaming and then an hour of phone time or texting. You can have your phone with your friends and text um, socially that might be excluded from the screen time, as long as um, your child is not on their phone for their homework, uh, there are a lot of ways to set it up. You just have to get ahead of the belief that it's not okay to disappoint my child, that my child will be angry when I, when I set limits on their phone, but that's okay because my goal is teaching them how to manage motivation as in, in their lives and into adulthood. And it's not easy. 
And if you have a friend, of, uh, a, if you have a co-parent, of course, but if you have other friends who have kids, you know, talk to them about what they're doing and see if you can all kind of get on the same page in a way. Um, that helps. Yes, it does. My daughter's best friend and my daughter are both not receiving their phones until the exact same moment. <laughs> there you go. Right, right. So that helps. So, you know, I mean, you'll all, parents will always hear from kids, well, so-and-so, blah, 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 and these parents, blah, 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 and you're them are so much better than you are, and then, yeah, no, no, that's true. Okay, but that's not, that's not, that they may be that, and this is you, and this is your family. Mm -hmm. We have to allow kids to be disappointed. You know, it's a muscle that we have to strengthen over time because God knows we've all gone through life dealing with disappointments and so has your child. And so, um, you know, having an earned privilege mentality helps them build that disappointment muscle and learn how to bounce back to also nurture resilience. So speaking of disappointment, I am sad to announce that we have run out of time. Um, this was such an incredibly helpful session. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, we received a, a lot of questions. You provided a lot of resources here. And I will just reiterate that your free resource will provide more strategies and we will make sure that gets in everyone's hands. Um, thank you. So to those who joined us, thank you for contributing to this conversation. To Dr. Celine, thank you for yet another really valuable contribution to the Attitude community. We hope that you will join us listeners for our next free webinar next week um, on the topic of ADHD medication options and benefits for children. And that is with Dr. Walt Kerniski. So until then, thank you for joining us. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you.